Hi, this is Philip Anthony Albertelli, and this is The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. And this is episode 51, episode 1, Reloaded. So I said last week I wasn't really going to do anything for the anniversary of the show, the one-year anniversary, that is, but I thought I would actually re-up the first episode for those who haven't heard it or for those who are having trouble finding it, because I noticed the archives on iTunes only seem to go back so far. Before deciding to re-up it, I listened back to it, and I sound almost like I was hit with an animal tranquilizer. Very mellow, very low-key, but I still think the content, my words, have merit. Uh, So I'm proud of the content, but as far as the delivery... I'd probably sound even a little more mellow than usual, although that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Before I cue that up, though, there was one, uh, I guess you could call it news story that I want to talk about. It was either this past Friday or this past Thursday. I was watching Joy Behar's show on Current TV. I believe the name of it is Say Anything. A lot of you probably know her as um, a co-host of The View, or you may have watched her nightly CNN talk show before it got canceled. And then, surprise, she popped up on Current. And I actually like her. Uh, I think some people find her abrasive, but that's probably one of the things I like about her. I think she's a pretty funny lady, and she's pretty smart, too. Although, at times... I find her interviewing style a little frustrating. Maybe one of her guests says something that begs for a follow-up question, but instead of pursuing the matter further, she just goes, I see. Yep. Uh Uh-huh. Interesting. (laughs) And she did that in this episode that I'm referring to, and, and I was ready to pull my hair out. And it was one of those moments that kind of reminded me why I do the podcast. So this is the first time I saw this segment, but she was talking about it like they do it often. It's a segment about religion that she does, and I guess she calls it Holy Rollers. And she had a Catholic priest on that I've seen um, before in other shows. He kind of does the rounds. Maybe middle-aged, kind of good shape, thin guy, gray hair, like movie star smile. Um... Then she had some kind of like a young, attractive, blonde girl on, I guess, who's something like a Christian fundamentalist. And then she had um, a rabbi on, and and the rabbi seemed like the most enlightened and um, secular, perhaps, of the crew. And they were discussing the topic of gay marriage. And it was interesting, the girl in the middle, the um, devout Christian did something hypocritical that you often hear certain believers do, and it's what made me want to pull my hair out. I think it might have been the rabbi who was kind of bringing up things in passing about the kind of ugly nature of some of the content of the Old Testament. And she was basically saying, oh, well, we as Christians, we're New Testament people, Um, we don't focus as much on the Old Testament, or you don't have to pay as much attention to the Old Testament. But of course, when the subject of homosexuality and gay marriage came in, then, oh, all of a sudden it's time to revert back to Leviticus. Uh, God says in the Old Testament that homosexuality is wicked and unnatural and the rest of it. So almost in the same breath, you know, she was saying that basically... Oh, the Old Testament, don't have to worry about it as much. Kind of a secondary book. Uh, the New Testament's where it's at. Oh, but when it comes to homosexuality, uh, of course the Old Testament's right. God said, don't lay down, mention lay down with other men. And as Cenk Uger, the host of the Young Turks, has pointed out before, and I've joked about, the Old Testament also contains prohibitions against many other things shellfish, uh, working on the Sabbath, but um, fundamentalist Christians and sometimes even cafeteria Christians don't seem as concerned about shellfish or working on the Sabbath as they do about homosexuality. And so the woman just kind of went along in that vein, talking about homosexuality was unnatural, how 
it's an insult to God to go against the way he quote unquote made us. And, um, and of course, Joy Behar did what I was jokingly alluding to before. Instead of calling the woman out on her hypocrisy or how she was contradicting herself in one breath, um, saying that we're New Testament people, then in the, you know, the next breath or the same breath, saying that we need to adhere to God's view of homosexuality as portrayed in the Old Testament. Instead of calling her out on that, um, instead of asking her if she believed um, whether or not gay people were born gay, um, Joy Behar just does a, uh-huh, yeah, I see, interesting, and then moves on to the next thing. I wanted to pull my hair out. I wanted to be like, step through the TV and be like, let me ask the questions. But the um, rabbi said something very interesting. I think a couple of times on the show, I had talked about how one of the reasons why there's a prohibition against homosexuality in the Old Testament might be that the early monotheistic Jews were trying to compete in a way with pagan religions and pagan priesthoods and trying to keep their people from straying from their budding monotheistic religion over to one of the pagan uh, neighboring pagan religions. And supposedly back in the day, uh, there in some pagan religions, there were kind of gender bending priests. There were pagan religions that had um, ceremonies that supposedly included homosexual rites and things like that. So the stern prohibition against homosexuality might have had more to do with trying to set clear boundaries between Judaism and paganism that had to do with people thinking that God um, inherently disapproved of homosexuality. And when I've brought this up on the show, trying to be as truthful and intellectually honest as I can means a lot to me. And I think that you as, you as listeners deserve it. So when there's something I'm not sure about, I let you know that I'm not sure about it. And so when I've brought that up in the past on the show, I've offered the caveat that I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure where it comes from factually. I've heard it said on documentaries. I don't know if it's true or not. But it's very interesting because the rabbi had talked about how the prohibition against homosexuality in the Old Testament, how he also thought it had to do with trying to keep Jews from gravitating towards neighboring cultic practices. And it didn't really have anything to do about a, a loving relationship between two consenting adults. And it was even interesting to hear the Catholic priest kind of echo that sentiment. And he too was saying that how in the ancient Middle East, in quote-unquote biblical times, they probably didn't have the same notion that we have today of a loving relationship between two people of the same sex. Um, the prohibition against homosexuality probably had something to do with um, either cultic practices or a prohibition against supposedly heterosexual men for some reason or another, laying down with other men. But no one ever called the woman out on, you know, her comments that homosexuality is unnatural, that engaging in homosexuality goes against God's desires or the way God made things. And um, in part, she's probably getting that from, you know, there's a basic idea that, that in fairness, there's some truth to it, that obviously with most animal species, um, well... Aside from those that, like single-celled organisms that reproduce asexual, asexually, you usually need a male and a female to come together to reproduce. So in that sense, you could say that heterosexual reproduction is mandatory for um, the perpetuation of most species. And in that sense, you could argue that's natural. But as I've also said on the show before, homosexuality, bisexuality is rampant in the animal kingdom. And as far as I can tell, although at times there can be, I believe, certain cultural influences on a person's sexual identity or sexual orientation, for the most part, I believe that where 
born um, with a certain sexual orientation, that we're born wired a certain way sexually. And I've often used myself as an example, joking around that when I was a school kid, no one needed to tell me to be attracted to the curves of my female teachers or to be attracted to, um, as embarrassing as it is, Suzanne Summers on old reruns of Three's Company or Chitara from the Thundercats. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was, or no one had to tell my heart to skip a beat when I suddenly found myself looking into the eyes of the girl sitting across from me when my interest suddenly turned from older women to girls my own age. Um, and I imagine that's in most cases, although, like I said, maybe in some cases there can be cultural influences, say like in ancient Greece or in societies where they keep the genders separated. Um, I, I think most, I think the, the human sex drive is so strong that you couldn't change your sexual identity if you wanted to. So I just found the woman's statements ignorant and hypocritical, and I wish someone called her out on them. So if Joy Behar wasn't going to do it, I figured at least I could do it after the fact. Uh, but with that being said, now I'll cue up episode one of The Week in Doubt. Here we go. Hi, I'm Philip Anthony Albertelli. Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Week in Doubt a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. And I really want to emphasize the whoever, because I don't want this podcast to seem exclusive, or at least not too exclusive. I'd like it to be not just for fellow non-believers, but for people of a philosophical bent in general, the intellectually curious, etc. As you could probably surmise from the title, my basic goal is to cover topical issues that have to do with religion, atheism, and then basically elaborate with my own philosophical take on things. Before I move on to any of the aforementioned topical issues, I should probably give a brief introduction to my own religious views or lack thereof and how they developed. I'm always a little hesitant to label my beliefs. On the one hand, I think maybe I just have a healthy aversion to labels because I know they can be constricting. And on the other hand, I think it's because of that strange overlap between the terms atheist and agnostic. I believe it was T.H. Huxley, a man who was known as Darwin's bulldog due to his strong stance in defense of the idea of natural selection, who coined the term agnostic. I'm a fan of Penn Jillette, and I remember listening to him recently, and he had described the word agnostic as a kind of weasel word, meaning a nicer, softer, more palatable way of saying atheist. I think most of us tend to think of agnostic as referring to someone who claims to not be sure whether or not there's a god, and an atheist is someone who claims that there is no god. But I don't think it's that clear cut. In fact, I'm trying to think of the staunchest atheists out there. Maybe people like the new atheists, uh, people who I admire, like the late Christopher Hitchens, um, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris. And um, I think all of them have more sense than to actually claim that they know 100% that there is no God. I think it's more the case, and I'll include myself here, that an atheist is someone not who claims to know 100% that there isn't a god, but who tends to think that religions are man-made belief systems and they doubt the existence of god because the empirical evidence just doesn't seem to be there and the supernatural claims of, of various world religions don't really seem to pass muster. And I think that's where the overlap lies. Um, neither an atheist nor an agnostic would claim to know for certain whether there was or wasn't a god. We may tend to think of an agnostic as someone who's more open-minded than um, that stereotype many people have as, of the smug um, stubborn atheist, but in reality there is that overlap. 
So I suppose I kind of fit both definitions. On the one hand, I don't claim to know for certain whether there is or isn't a god, but on the other hand, I certainly doubt his, her, or its existence. Ergo, I guess I'd be happy being labeled, or at least relatively comfortable being labeled either an atheist or an agnostic. But I guess if I was to choose a label for myself, I would simply refer to myself as a non-believer. It's uh, pretty much an accurate description, and it doesn't carry any of the connotations that you belong to some kind of group or organization. Which I guess brings me to my first topic. I know I'm a little behind the times with this one, but I'll ask that you forgive me since it's taken a while to get this project started. I was watching Bill Maher, um, real time with Bill Maher on HBO, as I am wont to do. And this is probably about three weeks ago now. Um, he had Kennedy on. I remember um, growing up watching her, uh, now well into my 30s. Um, she was a VJ on MTV back in the day, and now I believe she's a radio host, and she's pretty well known for her libertarian views. And as much as I like her, she said something um, during the show that just totally got under my skin, and it's probably a pet peeve for a lot of people who identify as atheists or non-believers. The subject of religion had come up, as it often does on Bill's show, and she had replied to something Bill had said by saying, atheism is a religion too. I think my jaw dropped a little, but I was thankful that at least um, Bill had the presence of mind to call her comment shallow. Shallow might seem a little harsh, but I actually think it's pretty appropriate because I think her comment shows a fundamental misunderstanding of atheism. And it kind of goes back to what I was just discussing when I was talking about the overlap between atheism and agnosticism. There's this kind of misconception that the atheist believes 100% that there is no God and therefore um, they're a person in a f of faith in a sense because it takes faith to believe 100% that something doesn't exist. And I actually used to hold a um, similar view too back in my earlier, more idealistic days. I used to kind of, even though I had an aversion to labels, I used to kind of pride myself on um, being merely agnostic and at least keeping the door open for the possibility that there might be something more. And so I used to kind of proudly say too that I thought atheism was a religion and I was wisely you know, in the, in the middle in between the fundamental religious person and the uh, kind of bleak, stubborn atheist. And of course, as I got older and um, began to read the works of atheist authors more and, and whatnot, I came to realize just what I talked about earlier, there is that overlap where even the staunchest of atheists, if they're sensible, doesn't claim to know 100% um, what the ultimate truth of the universe is, whether there is or isn't some sort of higher power out there. Um, so that just drives me crazy when people fall back on that old saw that atheism is a religion too. And who knows, maybe it got under Bill's skin a little too, because I think it was the next week where he kind of uh, referred to it um, during his new rules segment. And he actually had a pretty funny remark where I'm, I'm paraphrasing, where he said that saying that atheism was a religion was like saying abstinence was a sexual position. And as funny as it is, I think it's also pretty accurate because atheism is pretty much the absence of religion, not a religion in and of itself. I remember that I mentioned in passing 
that I would talk about the development of my beliefs a little. And uh, as you could probably guess from my Italian surname, I was raised Catholic. Uh, we were fairly observant. I think like a lot of families, it started out church every Sunday. Then it kind of devolved to church just on the holidays. And then um, pretty much church not at all. But I did go to Sunday school, CCD, um, First Communion, Confirmation, that sort of thing. I think even at an early age, I was pretty intellectually curious in regards to life's big questions. And I think like all children or most children, I had that moment, that kind of loss of innocence, that moment when you're confronted that with the fact that no, Virginia, there isn't a Santa Claus or Easter Bunny or etc. I remember kind of working from there and thinking, well, adults have a similar way of talking about God and Jesus as they do when talking about those assorted mythical holiday figures. Somewhere in my youth, I developed a avid interest in mythology and that kind of blossomed into an interest in world history, world religion. And I think once you start really studying those things, you begin to see the parallels between the belief system you've been indoctrinated into in those dead ones we call mythologies or the study of world history or a world religion can show you how belief systems evolve out of other belief systems um you begin to notice things like the contradictions um within religious texts for instance, if we look at the Old Testament, um, we have things like doublets, which are more than one account of the same story, uh, especially in the book of Genesis, um, with little differences in details, uh, the amount of animals brought aboard the ark, that sort of thing. If you move to the New Testament, you have things like the discrepancy between the synoptic gospels and the gospel of john where john has um, christ actually dying on a different day than in the synoptics most likely as a kind of literary device so that um, christ could be depicted in his account as the paschal lamb as an actual uh, passover sacrifice and if um, you know your Mesopotamian mythology, you start to notice kind of weird parallels. Um, for instance, um, a lot of you probably have heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh and the flood story contained therein and how closely it parallels um, the Noah flood story in the Old Testament. And I should say... Um, despite the fact that I'm a non-believer, and this will probably come up a lot in the uh, series, I absolutely love the holidays, and I think those of us who are raised Catholic or Christian in general, we just take, when we're young, we take the holidays for granted as, as if they've always been Christian holidays. Um, we just take them at face value. But as you study world history and the history of religion, you learn the weird little... Uh, very interesting facts um, about how Christian holidays were grafted on top of pre-existing pagan traditions or combined with them. And we end up with um, things like the birth of Christ being celebrated on the 25th of December, which had already been a celebration time for the uh, the god Mithra or Mithras. And... Um, the Norse pagan traditions uh, of dragging an evergreen in and burning Yule logs and things like that. The Catholic All Saints Day, All Hallows Eve being grafted on top of um, the Celtic uh, New Year Samhain and henceforth becoming Halloween. I think 
all those little things just kept drawing my attention more and more to the possibility or fact that religions are man-made and that there isn't um, seemingly a heck of a lot of evidence to back up religion's supernatural claims. And I think I also noticed that a lot of people kind of employed that cafeteria Catholic approach where because of the um, progress, ever continuing progress of science, um, religion is forced to come to loggerheads with science and give way in some areas to reasonable people at least uh, to scientific fact. For instance, we know that evolution is a fact. It's called the theory of evol evolution, but I think uh, most scientists would agree it's a fact. We have the fossil record and um, DNA evidence. Um, we can see genetically how species are related to other species. Some people would say, all right, yeah, I, I admit, um, I, I think um, the story of Adam and Eve is just a parable. We know about human evolution, so no one magically plopped down um, two perfect uh, human specimens, a male and a female, and yet they'll still believe in the resurrection. Um, I think it was Richard Dawkins one time who made a pretty valid and somewhat disturbing point how the death and resurrection of Christ was in part at least supposed to be to save man from original sin, the, to redeem man from the fall of, um, in the garden. But if you believe that the tale of the garden is a parable, then that kind of knocks out the foundation of the purpose of the, of the death and resurrection of Christ. And I think just things like that, um, just noticing the man-made nature of religion eroded uh, away over time at my faith. I should point out, um, I don't think it was ever the case that I wanted to be a non-believer. I think that's a common misconception uh, about atheists. I, I actually think becoming a non-believer at least in my case, was a rather painful experience. It can be pretty harsh to feel that the existential carpet, so to speak, has been pulled out from under you to have to face the fact that um, the meaning of life, the whole supernatural cosmology that you've been taught um, may be completely man-made in a sense that you're on your own to try to figure out what it's all about and um, what's true and what isn't. I think I actually wanted to believe, was even desperate to believe, but my reason just led me elsewhere. Um, for a while I found solace in Eastern religion. Um, since I had lost faith in the idea of a personal god, of a uh, sentient creator, there was some comfort in um, that Eastern concept of God, where not really the personal God, but that totality of the universe, that oneness of all being. And I think it might have been Pope uh, John Paul once who described Buddhism as a kind of... Um, maybe, a, a, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, I might be completely wrong, but a, a romanticized atheism. Uh, I believe he did call it a kind of atheism. And I think that's true in a way. I think I almost looked at Eastern um, philosophy and religion as kind of training wheels for atheism or agnosticism because there is that big difference between Western and Eastern spirituality where in the West, we have that desire to believe that our self is eternal and that there is this patriarchal, um, personal creator. Where in the East, especially in Buddhism, um, the focus is moved away from the self. And in fact, in Buddhism, we have the term nirvana, meaning uh, something along the lines of it the extinguishing of the flame or the extinguishing of the self 
where reincarnation even is a kind of punishment and the ultimate goal is to attain that selfless oneness and break that cycle of um, birth and death. Then even um, that after a while seemed kind of romanticized to me. And even though I still love that concept of cosmic oneness, what does it really mean empirically? And uh, I think luckily the human psyche, like the human body, is relatively resilient. And I've actually reached a point in my life where the idea that I may not be eternal, the idea that there may not be a creator out there, doesn't seem so scary or painful anymore. And um, but I don't want to drone on too long because I want to do a whole episode at one point on how even being a non-believer, you can still live a very rich and fulfilling life and even experience what, for lack of a better word, you may, might consider spiritual experiences, um, the transcendent, the numinous, as Christopher Hitchens used to like to call it. I wanted to quickly cover um, a couple other recent stories. There's one um, that you may already have heard of, uh, of Miley Cyrus actually quoting Lawrence Krauss, as uh, surreal as that seems. She had tweeted out one of his quotes, and I'm paraphrasing yet again. The basic gist was he was talking about how we're basically all made of stardust, and it was stars rather than Jesus that died so we could live. Um, I actually thought I can understand why people faith would be offended by actually thought it was pretty cool that um, a young person in the public eye seemed to at least in passing take an interest in science and uh, take a moment to uh, tweet something that heady. And I think she may even have gotten death threats, which doesn't seem very Christian. So, um, yeah, people should probably not do that. <laughs> and uh, there's one other story you may have heard of where... Kirk Cameron, I actually saw this, he was on um, Piers Morgan Tonight, and Piers Morgan had asked him about his beliefs on homosexuality, and he basically said that it was unnatural, and it was a danger to the um, foundations of civilization, etc. And that brought to mind this concept that I have, um, I'm sure... Other thinkers have probably long beaten me to it, but in my own head, I draw this kind of dichotomy between um, what I consider a kind of universal human morality and then kind of religious or dogmatic morality. I think universal morality, whether or not it's truly universal, I don't know, but I hope so. Universal morality to me would be most of us would agree that rape, murder, theft, breaking into a, um, a person's home, um, child abuse, whatever. these things are all wrong because they violate our fellow human beings. And hopefully we understand in our core whether uh, we're religious or not that those things are bad. And then I um, think of religious morality as those weird <laughs> prohibitions, things that we're not violating another person but still are forbidden to do because of kind of obscure religious reasons like um, having to eat fish on certain Fridays or not being able to pick up sticks on Saturdays or um, you know prohibitions about uh, what gender you have to lie with uh, being a straight guy I feel like I don't have much of a dog in this fight other than I think it's wrong for other people to tell consenting adults um, what gender uh, of person they uh, can or cannot lie with. And I really think um, a kind of homophobia on a religious basis is a good example of that kind of strange religious dogmatic morality um, where no one's really being hurt by it. It's between consenting adults, but because there's a few passages um, about it in your particular religious text, um, you believe that it's a horrible sin. And I think it was Cenk Uygur um, on the Young Turks, I'm a big fan of the Young Turks, who had actually 
brought up a good point that shellfish is also um, prohibited in the Bible. Yet people seem to get far more worked up about um, things of a sexual nature. Um, I don't know, I guess people just get more worked up about sex than they do about crustaceans and bivalves. So, food for thought. And I think that's it for the inaugural episode. So, thank you for listening, and hopefully I'll be back soon. Thank you.